I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak with you all today. And um, rather provocatively, my title is Defeating Diabetes by Choice or by Design. So um, I don't need to go through the statistics just to say that the prevalence of diabetes is increasing. We have a high prevalence of obesity, particularly in Pacific population and lowest in the Asian and Indian population living in New Zealand. And just following on from Karina's talk there, that it raises some interesting issues around why that is. For me, the statistics that you've already seen before of uh, increasing prevalence of diabetes in both Indian and Pacific, yet the remarkable dis dis difference in, in BMI or prevalence of obesity. And, uh, and I don't need to labor the fact that this is early and it's also aggressive in terms of outcomes. And we, you've all seen the slide before that there is a increase in uh, the numbers or proportions of people who have uh, poor control, particularly in Pacific and Māori populations, in the uh, Pacific and the Orange and Māori, versus all the other ethnic groups, particularly in, in uh, the younger population, are less so in terms of that gap. We need to understand why that is. And one of the thoughts that hasn't been raised today is that for young people in particular, a lot of the treatments that we have to offer them actually have troublesome side effects like hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, and weight gain. Two things that we all really, really despise at any age, but particularly so in the younger age groups. And particularly so for Māori and Pacific, where obesity or increased weight is, is a major problem. So I'll touch on some other um, aspects of treatment that we could do to improve this equity gap. We know that diabetes control is linked to complications. And there is that perception that we go in a one way uh, from pre-diabetes to diabetes to poorly controlled diabetes. And people often think that on the spectrum of care that they receive, that this is an indicator that they're getting into troublesome uh, complications. And by avoiding uh, insulin, some people feel that that is a way of perceiving that they're still in that um, early phase and this is a marker of bad things to come. And the complications are related to blood vessel health. And not only do we concern ourselves with blood glucose control, but we also look at blood pressure, blood cholesterol, stopping smoking, and all the things that, that can make our blood vessels more likely to, to block or hemorrhage. So we have a range from, from diet, lifestyle, multiple medications, injectable insulin, bariatric surgery, and a host of monitoring and, and testing that goes along with this journey. So when we look at poor uh, glycemic control, we have the um, problems of highest renal failure incidence in Pacific people, whoops, sorry. And we also see that this is a remarkably, uh, disproportionately affects uh, Pacific people in terms of end stage renal failure, Māori and other ethnic groups. All the other blood vessel complications in terms of amputations, uh, visual, vision loss, myocardial infarctions and strokes um, are, are all accompanying this. So what can we change by personal choice? Now it's, it's often a perception of diet and exercise being a profound item that is, uh, susceptible, is something that we can influence by personal choice. And health literacy is our own personal responsibility when actually there are a lot of components that we have responsibility to in both of those areas. And when we look at prevalence of diabetes, we see a nice stacking of high prevalence in people who have um, high, or at least live in postcodes that are, are deemed to have high deprivation. And there's a high deprivation followed by low deprivation. It stacks very nicely. And so what does that mean for management of diabetes as well in terms of engagement with all of the things that we ask of it? Along with uh, living in high areas of um, uh, socioeconomic deprivation, are all of these things that Brian's mentioned in terms of financial strain, work, family, housing, depression. There's also a, a layer of social stigma around uh, diabetes. There is embedded in the uh, requirement or advice around diet and exercise around fat shame. There is 
a personal responsibility that's overstated by many people who have the disease, who don't have the disease, and the funders that fund the, the services that we need to combat the disease. And so I'm just going to change tack now about what we can change by design and research. And my colleagues in the Morris Wilkins Centre are going to speak after the lunch break on, on the um, developments or investigations that we've been doing in the area of, um, of genetics. But I think this has a real role to play in fighting the social stigma and fat shame and personal responsibility side of things when it comes to susceptibility of diabetes. So firstly, in terms of response to diet and exercise, I wonder how many people think that if we only just restricted what we were eating and exercised more, that we'd be able to lose weight. And all those people with the stats don't know that, that this is what is, is, is the problem. Well, let me tell you a little bit about physiology and biology to say that that's not as easy as that. Because as soon as you reduce meal frequency and size, our body and our biological signals are geared to re to recorrect that. So it's no easier to lose weight than it is to think your way out of um, a whole bunch of conditions that can affect the central nervous system in terms of regulating um, uh, whatever it may be, whether it be glucose, body weight, sodium, or, th or thyroid levels. Yet we have got this layer of diet and exercise in there, which, is, which means that often People don't appreciate that some people find it easier to maintain their weight than others. Some people find it easier to lose weight than others. And what we don't know is that which of these common gene variants, of which there are a, a huge number that have been involved in appetite regulation, found in particularly largely European populations, that are very strongly associated with small differences in BMI units. Now, don't be concerned about the y-axis here. It says 0.3 of a BMI unit change in people who carry, say, this um, variant in FTO. At an individual level, that's quite profound, and we have got several examples in cholesterol and blood pressure where these variants actually targeted very effectively with medications that we take for granted, like the statins. What we also know is that there is a similar body fat seen in people of widely variable BMI. So what we don't have is x-ray vision to see the people walking down the street as to how much body fat they actually carry, and we make assumptions by the size that they appear. So this is the data on 28% body fat, and at 28% body fat, people can have very different, these are the scatter plots, of very different BMIs. And I'd like you to look at the pink arrow of a person with 24 BMI units who has the same body fat as a Pacific person of 34 BMI units. I tried to look on Google Images last night to try and illustrate what that might look like. And so from behind, you might not even appreciate that this person has the same body fat as this person. In fact, my obstetrician made that mistake when they looked at me when I had gestational diabetes in my second pregnancy and said I did not need to have an um, oral glucose tolerance test. I did not look like a woman who might have increased body fat. And because I'm Indian, I think often I, I do have to remember this, that my body fat's going to be very different to my colleagues and other women um, at the same apparent BMI. And not to mention the cultural factors when I had um, my second pregnancy of my mother wanting to overfeed me thinking I was very um, underweight. So genetic factors really impact on our body fat mass at different depots. And what we can appreciate this more clearly with um, MRIs is where our body um, likes to store fat and where our body likes to lose fat from. And we have no conscious control of this. I wish we had. I can think of all sorts of things I'd rather dream of. <laughs> But this is a picture of a Samoan woman, 61-year-old, before and after very low-calorie diet, also known as the horrid diet, optifast <laughs> diet, um, that we um, have uh, as a way of, uh, of um, enabling weight loss. Now, she lost nine kilos after four weeks of this horrid diet, 87 to 78, 10% of her body weight. And this is an Indian woman before and after the same horrid diet. So she lost weight from 65 to 59. They both had type 2 diabetes at different body weights. The places in which they lost fat from were very, diff were very different. 
So this is a picture of someone with the head inside the image and their feet poking out. This is just below the belly button. And the white rim you can see is the subcutaneous fat, just under the skin. What you can't see so easily is the fat in the liver, the fat in the pancreas, and all the other organs wrapped around our intestines. Now that fat is more, more uh, detrimental to metabolic health than the uh, apparent size of the body and the girth of that individual. Walking down the street, you may not have picked this woman as having type 2 diabetes. So surprisingly, this woman, the Indian woman, lost very little fat from the inside and lost more fat from the outside, not where we want to be losing weight from. So how can we get at this without spending money on DEXA scans and MRI scans? Um, our genetics can give us a, bit, a more accurate handle of um, several parts of our physiology. And I'm just going to focus on the Krebs RF gene variant as it has particular relevance to Māori and Pacific people. This was first reported in 2016 um, by um, um, uh, some American um, investigator, Steve McGarvey, who went to American Samoa. And this um, hit the headlines to say that um, a gene variant strongly influences body mass index in Samoans. They called it a thrifty variant. And basically, if you look along the, uh, the, the DNA, there is a, just a point at which um, a, G changes to, uh, an, a G changes to an A within a gene called Krebs RF. No one knows what Krebs RF really does. No one really um, had any reason to take an interest in this gene until this hypothesis-free, let's look at what are the genes that are prevalent in, in um, overweight people versus underweight people actually threw this up as a very strong association. So we followed this up in New Zealand and we had um, access to just over 2,500 Māori and Pacific people who had donated their blood for the investigation of genetics for metabolic conditions. And we were able to confirm that indeed um, about a quarter of people carried the same um, A instead of G in this Krebs RF uh, gene, and that this was not fo found in any other ethnic group in our cohort either. And people who carried the A allele were heavier, about four kilos per allele. So those people who carried two copies were eight kilos heavier than the others. And they had, surprisingly, 40% lower risk of type 2 diabetes. So we all conflate an increased BMI, increased body weight, with increased risk of type 2 diabetes. But here you see the understanding the biology can really cross cut through some of our assumptions. And what we were able to find is that, to confirm exactly that this was a, uh, this was a true association, that people who carried the A um, had an increased BMI of 1.4 units, which is massively uh, which is massively higher than what all the other gene variants that have been found in Europeans to date. If we don't do this research in New Zealand, no one else will. So we also found that the people with Krebs RF gene variant were also taller by one and a half centimetres. And just being tall is one thing, but what does it mean about, um, about diabetes? Is being taller linked with greater pancreatic beta cell function that enables you to withstand um, an increased um, body mass and maybe an increased insulin response? So this is one of the questions that um, Dr. Troy Mary will be discussing with you along with Dr. Offa Jews just after the lunch break in terms of, uh, of further studies underway um, under the Morris Wilkins Centre program of investigations. So I'm just going to briefly touch on the role of um, Krebs RF variant in terms of how it can be applied to women with gestational diabetes. So in South Auckland, there's a study uh, that's just completed called the Humber Study, led by Leslie McCowan. And this was a prospective study that looked at a nutritional intervention um, for um, predominantly Pacific and Māori women, uh, of whom made up 72% of this population. So we had the opportunity to ask the participants, the women in those, in those studies, whether they would agree to a genetic test to see uh, whether they carried the genetic variant. And the 73% of those who agreed and had a GDM test, 30% um, developed GDM. So our hypothesis was that in non-pregnant adults, if this reduces the risk of type 2 diabetes, surely it should reduce the risk of gestational diabetes. It's a small study, not in the thousands, only 100. It was such a powerful effect, it was eight-fold lower. And the women who developed gestational diabetes, if they carried the Krebs RF A variant, 
they were eightfold lower in terms of their risk of gestational diabetes. People who carried two copies just didn't develop gestational diabetes in the small cohort. So this clearly needs replicating in the um, pregnancy cohort. But what it showed us was that weight gain did not differ in the small study. The negative predictive value of having a Krebs RF variant test, $10 genotyping test once in a lifetime, potentially could have a huge impact in your relative risk of developing gestational diabetes and a net 90% negative predictive value. And so we have to think very carefully about how we can apply this information um, and what are the next steps. So these are the things um, myself and my colleagues have been thinking about in terms of how to follow up this research in a larger uh, uh, population of um, Māori and Pacific uh, pregnant women. And our first um, thoughts are to see uh, what, what their priorities are and how we can best communicate this information and, um, and examine whether it impacts on motivation for weight management, metabolic risk screening, and ultimately provide better gestational diabetes screening. Now I'm going to switch to changing um, uh, or impacting on management of diabetes, and I'd like to talk about better use of existing medications. So in New Zealand, um, in 2019, this is the, um, the ladder of medications that we have to treat type 2 diabetes. So we start with diet and exercise lifestyle changes. We use metformin in the vast majority, followed by the recently funded vildagliptin. Our population is about to be vildagliptinized across the country. Uh, then we have our sulfonylureas. These can cause hypoglycemia and weight gain. And then we have insulin that's injectable. And insulin has an unlimited glucose lowering capacity, but it has complexity in terms of needing to have blood sugar monitoring to get the right dose at the right time and uh, carries weight gain. We also have some other medications that, um, that were funded like pioglitazone that doesn't cause hypos but does cause weight gain. And acabose that's um, often not well tolerated because of GI side effects. So the reasons for this, this gap in poor glycemic control can be divided into clinician factors and patient factors. And Brian's illustrated very well about how a very proactive practice can uh, provide a structure to um, give opportunistic care and proactive recall, but a lot of practices may not have that ability to do so. Complexity of accessing care for the, for the patients ultimately is a, is a huge factor in wanting to escalate up that pathway. The number of medications, their timing, their side effects, particularly hypoglycemia, particularly weight gain, the, uh, the complexity of taking the medications, their cost, and ultimately illness and treatment beliefs all impact on that. So there are delays in treatment and intensification that we think may have a multiple factors, but one size fits all algorithms that we have here, a perception of patient non-adherence rather than treatment failure, are two issues I'd like to explore. So a commonly held belief is that averages, average pioglitazone response, average side effects of these classes and medications is what happens in the large randomized controlled trials that we have to utilize these drugs. Let me um, just give you an insight into how these drugs are registered by drug companies are side effects and efficacy and safety. Biomarkers of drug response are not, on the, um, are not a priority to get a drug funded. Here is a study that came, came out um, just a couple of years ago um, from uh, Exeter, where I did my PhD on genetics of diabetes um, uh, uh, many years ago now. Um, and what they did was they took one of those randomized control trials on pioglitazone, very old one with sulfonylureas, and these are the ticks that you can see in the blue that you get with sulfonylureas. You get a large drop in HbO and C initially, and from years one to five, you get a, 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 an increase in HbO and C. So you get treatment failure after about one year. 
And this is for non-obese males, obese males, non-obese females, non-obese females. So the, the tick for sulfonylureas is uniform across those four groups. When you look at the red line, that is the HbA1c lowering that you get with pioglitazone. And that's very different. You can see the lowest drop and the most maintained drop is seen in obese females. To some extent in the obese males also, there's a more durable response to pioglitazone and a, more, a greater response to pioglitazone compared to in the non-obese males. And my clinicians, as well as myself, have an inclination to only offer pioglitazone in non-obese males, thinking they are the ones that would more accept, readily accept its side effect of weight gain, when actually its effects on glucose are the most modest in the non-obese people. One of the side effects of pioglitazone is bone thinning and fracture risk, which may not be a concern for people with obesity. So it's really important to have a look at some straightforward um, factors that we all have to hand as to whether they might predict glucose lowering response to get the right treatment to the right person instead of following a one-size-fits-all algorithm. Also, there's some interesting um, uh, data from, again, from Exeter that was published last year about the glucose lowering uh, effect by um, a class of medications that Vildagliptin comes from, the one that we've just got funded last year, that to suggest that those people who are obese and have high cholesterol or high triglycerides have the least glucose lowering compared to people who are um, less obese and have um, normal cholesterol. So that's counterintuitive really when people who have um, obesity and high triglycerides have about half the glucose lowering compared to the non-obese people with normal cholesterol. Vildagliptinizing our New Zealand population with diabetes is preferentially going to affect those people who are, who are non-obese and have normal lipids. So we need to evaluate the impacts of vildagliptin. We've got um, varying responses in my own population as well as what my GP colleagues say that they have. The heterogeneity in response to vildagliptin um, is quite considerable. And so there, is, uh, there are studies to say that vildagliptin works very well in Asian populations. What we need to know is how effective it is in Pacific people. Is pioglitazone more effective? How, how effective is it in people with and without the CRAB-RF gene variant? And so to answer this question, um, I, uh, and um, in collaboration with others, have been doing a, a study called WORTH, which one is right here, a type 2 diabetes medication study, to test whether individual glucose response to pioglitazone and vildagliptin can be predicted by various factors, including ethnicity, age, gender, BMI, lipids, C-peptide, and genetics, particularly CRAB-RF gene variant. And so our aim is to recruit 300 patients with type 2 diabetes who haven't been on these two medications and are not on insulin, and they get four months of one followed by four weeks of the other, and then we give the end of study individual summary to the patient and their GP with their HbA1c responses and side effects and patient preference. We're now, um, we started recruiting earlier this year. We're up to um, 244 at last count. <coughs> Uh, we've had 48% Māori and Pacific. We really, really are targeting Māori and Pacific. We want to achieve a 50% recruitment rate, and we're on track thanks to um, a number of our research partners through the Morris Wilkins Centre, uh, Diabetes Foundation Aotearoa, Middlemore here, ProCare, um, Tongan Health Society, Pinnacle have all been helping us recruit. So we're very... Um, very much interested in seeing what those results have and hopefully I'll be able to share those with you this time next year. So what we're hoping to do is have some research informed targeted approaches to using the existing medications better for better diabetes control. And also um, uh, evaluate some um, prescribing gaps and variation between practices which is what my question to Brian was earlier. Now I'd like to switch to better access to new medications for type 2 diabetes, particularly of the two classes, SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists. And these two classes of medications, in addition to all the benefits that we know come from uh, blood glucose lowering, have an additional impact on lowering the risk of heart attacks, heart failure and stroke, further lowering the risk of kidney failure, 
and further lowering the risk of death. They have a very low risk of troublesome hypoglycemia and also have weight losing benefits. So these have a real potential for impact in our population. One of the reasons for the delays potentially in prioritising um, diabetes treatments and diabetes funding could be from social stigma, fat shame and personal responsibility that makes us a less vocal group from a public uh, uh, side and also from practitioner sides. And I have a program of uh, obesity symposium about medical students and their training in fourth year where we go over those issues around personal biases around how we deliver healthcare and how we perceive um, treatment escalation and um, healthcare delivery to be. So at the moment, um, these are the two that are registered in New Zealand. The tablet for SGLT2 inhibitors um, costs $90 per month. I can count on one hand how many people um, have been able to afford that. I do um, mention it uh, in passing to everybody I see. Um, $240 to $280 per month as a subcutaneous daily or weekly injection for a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now remembering it's not in the same basket as insulin because it doesn't have all the complexity of insulin in terms of monitoring and adjusting dose. It's a, it's a single dose, fixed dose that you can take uh, daily or weekly depending on how much you can afford. And finally, I'd like to talk about bariatric surgery um, in terms of, um, in New Zealand, we uh, commonly provide two types of procedures, a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy where most of the stomach's removed and um, the remainder is like, it resembles a sleeve, and uh, ruin Y gastric bypass where the, most of the stomach in the first part of the small bowel is disconnected from the passage of food. And both of these procedures are done laparoscopically through keyhole surgery. And they have remarkable benefits in terms of diabetes remission and burden from all the other conditions, that, uh, many of the conditions that um, go along with diabetes. And so this is our data from Auckland from patients who were randomised and blinded to which of the two surgeries they were getting in terms of uh, reduction in HbA1c and actual remission from uh, diabetes at one and three years. They all had type 2 diabetes, 30% of our population were Pacific. Um, or Māori. And 80% um, no longer had to take diabetes medications at one and three years and uh, had their HbA1c in, um, uh, very close to normal. Weight change was more profound or, uh, with uh, 40 kilos or 36 kilos at, um, at one and three years respectively after the bypass and slightly more modest after the sleeve gastrectomy of 34 and 27 kilos at one and three years. And we have good quality of life um, scores as well, uh, data from the study. Overall, we've had just over um, 9,100 surgeries performed in New Zealand since 2004. The public figures are on the blue, private figures are in the red. And, um, and in terms of New Zealand deprivation index, this is um, something that um, illustrates the limitations of using postcodes as a deprivation index score because you can see the numbers of people um, in the so-called um, high deprivation score that uh, still were um, receiving private um, bariatric surgery. So if we take the um, top six of the um, uh, centres that provide bariatric surgery in New Zealand in the public sector, there is variation in the intervention rate by DHB. Um, and more importantly, in terms of by ethnicity, we do see that Pacific people have half the intervention rate compared to Māori and Europeans. From data from 2013 to 2017, it seems to be, have been increasing, but still at a lower rate in Pacific. So it's good to see um, Dr. Tamazin Taylor in the audience and it's her data I'm presenting here. Um, thank you Tamazin for this um, work. And here we show that the, that the lowest proportion um, who uh, complete bariatric surgery after acceptance onto our bariatric program is Pacific men. And the reasons for this is uh, complex. But disengagement from um, bariatric surgery programs is the highest in, uh, in Pacific people. 
And these are the other, um, other reasons presented. So there's a number of reasons for that. And I think um, Tamazin will be able to um, uh, discuss some of those, but potentially the negative experiences of the bariatric program. Perhaps health professional communication style, maybe um, lack of alternatives to surgery. And there's a big treatment gap between green prescription versus bariatric surgery being the only two funded options for people who are wanting to have significant weight loss in New Zealand. So this is my summary slide. Defeating diabetes by choice and by design is what we'd like to get to. And that we have some real um, insights to learn from studying the biology of diabetes and obesity in terms of the emphasis that we place on personal choice versus choice architecture, health literacy, um, in terms of diet and exercise um, advice that we have, and how we can have a reduction in risk of type 2 diabetes and gestational diabetes with a CREB RF gene variant that also um, uh, increases apparent BMI. And so that can help with potentially personal risk stratification and uh, the uncertainty that goes with why do I have diabetes when my sibling, friend, or someone else at a, at a different weight um, doesn't. Um, screening and monitoring our passive and reactive healthcare system issues around their heterogeneity in the, in the quality of um, care that we're able to access um, and potentially variation by um, postal code there also. Medications in terms of better using our existing medications and research informed selection of medications with greatest effect and rapid escalation to target and better access of new medications um, such as the SGLT2 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And bariatric surgery, better design of services for um, equitable utilisation for Pacific people. Thank you very much.